This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman. As the U.S. faces a shortage of rapid COVID tests amidst the Omicron surge, we turn now to speak to a scientist who developed an inexpensive rapid at-home COVID test nearly two years ago, but the FDA refused to approve it. Irene Bosch is the founder of the diagnostic company E25 Bio. She's a visiting professor at MIT, adjunct professor of medicine at Mount Sinai, New York. In March 2020, she submitted the test to the FDA for emergency authorization. The FDA approval never came. It would be another year before more expensive at-home COVID tests began appearing on the market. Today, those tests are hard to come by, if not impossible, as the U.S. grapples with 400 thousand new COVID infections a day. Irina Bosch joins us now from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Dr. Bosch, it's great to have you with us. Um, if you can tell us first what happened, and I want to credit an excellent article in ProPublica um, that brought you to our attention. Thank you. Yes, uh, it, it is a very a well done article. And um, What happened was that in 2020, we had a group of scientists had already made for about 10 years other very similar antigen tests for other viral diseases. So we jumped into COVID basically knowing a bit of what we were doing. So by April, we had already made a test. By July, we completed our first clinical trial in the United States. And indeed, it was the first submission to the FDA. It was this one. But then, um, short after we presented the data, uh, we learned that it was going to be really hard to meet the standards. We, of course, agree with having excellent tests being approved. At that time, we thought the standards were ill-defined and they were too harsh for meeting the, the requirements. Other than that, The test was excellent, and it could have been approved under 2021 standards. I want to interrupt for a second to remind people that um, the U.S. government came out with a test that was faulty at the beginning. It was a different test. Uh, they were faulty because they were doing PCR, which is molecular tests, not antigen tests, and they made a mistake in the primers, which are part in, integral part of this uh, molecular test. Yes. They made a mistake, which was um, a huge one, but they they repaired the damage. And for PCR or molecular tests, you can actually quickly in the lab iterate and fix it. But for antigen tests, FDA does not does not allow scientists like us to validate and approve the behavior of these tests in the lab. You have to do clinical trials, but not for PCR. Right. So explain why you were turned down and how many tests you could have gotten out there it related to what we're seeing now, this massive lack of testing available. Yeah. So generally, when you make this kinds of very simple tests, it's just a strip. You could, the robot that makes these could make millions a week. So the number is, is a non issue. We had really good manufacturers lined up to make these tests for us and for United States. So that's not a problem. So numbers are easily made available. Moreover, what happened to, to that particular case that we refer to, the E25 bio test, happened to other, also other companies. Basically, the, the requirements were such and perhaps maybe lack of experience. I mean, we were all new in the pandemic experience, right? Uh, FDA could have, could have uh, understand the way these antigen tests are meant to be used. And the reason why I say that is because for diagnostic only, like PCR, you have to be really super precise and you have to be, you know, very, very sensitive. For antigen tests that you use almost every day, anytime, anywhere, anyone, that's kind of the three things that one day Anthony Fauci said, that's how we will control the pandemic. These antigen tests work beautifully if you use them repeatedly. So basically that was the, that was the issue. There were no uh, directives or well set uh, forth in 2020 for the use of the antigen tests. So antigen tests can offer so much more. 
I want to go to what the FDA recently responded to the ProPublica report about COVID-19 rapid test that you created in March 2020. In the statement, FDA said, unfortunately, many submissions the FDA has received for home tests include incomplete or poor data, and it's the FDA's responsibility to protect the public health by declining to authorize poorly performing tests or those without complete data. If the FDA received a home test that the data and science supported in early to mid-2020, we would have quickly authorized it. Can you respond to this, Dr. Bosch? Yeah, of course that we want FDA to protect the public. I mean, as a scientist, we completely agree with that. What we don't agree is that if you have ways to validate the tests that are not the best or are way too strict, meaning you compare the, P the PCR with, with like a, a huge uh, expansion of the genome to a detection of a protein in your in your nasal cavity, so that's the that's the problem of the FDA. The FDA forgot to add to that quote. Indeed, we were mistaken. It would have been so nice to hear that. So ex people now know PCR tests take more time and they are more precise, but. Um, the country is now accepting, the government is now accepting that these uh, antigen tests, like yours is, is critical to day-to-day -day functioning. So explain when you say what's essential is the repeated test, and uh, um, explain why we are where we are today. Yeah, so this is a very important uh, question, because 50 percent of people with COVID do not present symptoms. So they will not get a PCR. They will not go to the doctor. They will not go to a hospital. So they're all around just spreading the disease every, everywhere. So the only, the only mobile or deployable device is actually an antigen test because it doesn't need a specialized apparatuses. It doesn't need a specialized technology that you need a nurse. You can do it yourself. So... By having 50% of cases being, or even more now, of cases that do not present a symptom, you ought to do it regularly in order to detect a asymptomatic case. So regularly means under the today's circumstances, you would have to do twice a week, minimum once a week, so that you can catch the 12th day of expansion of your viral infection. So that's what I mean with, with frequency. We just found out in 2020, we did another clinical trial for home use, and we found out that if you repeat antigen tests more than one day in a row, it reaches the same sensitivity as PCR. So those things FDA does not necessarily know or they have not acquired that knowledge into the regulatory body, which is sad. So, did other countries approve the rapid, um, quick COVID tests early on? I mean, countries like Britain, like Korea, and did it make a difference in their country in the spread of COVID? Yeah. So, yeah. So, Asia and Europe did approve many, many antigen tests. Forty different brands, whereas in the United States, you have barely like a handful. And so it is true that other countries had a completely different take on how these antigen tests would work. Indeed, they understood that there is a range of virus where this antigen test will detect beautifully day two, three, four, five, six, seven, but then it decays. So those countries that acquire that knowledge sooner than the regulatory body of USA, they actually did better. They deploy them to the population, and they're super inexpensive. We hear that in Germany, you could buy a test for 50 cents of a dollar. So that's not the case for USA. I mean, USA, you, the buy next test is what, like $23, $25 for two tests. This is expensive if you're expected to do this every single week, and let alone unavailable. <laughs> Absolutely. So these tests, because we made them before, we know you can make them at 50 cents at cost. Maybe, you know, you would say, okay, I'll sell them for a dollar or two or three. It's still like a decent margin for companies to return their investment. Uh, by, by all means, they don't cost that much. And moreover, which is super important, these um, antigen tests can be now understood by a cell phone 
and it, it becomes a super fancy gadget because the cell phone takes a picture of the test immediately in the cloud or in, in the you know immediately in real time you know it's a positive or negative and you can disperse that data on the on, on the fly so you have something simple linked to a mobile technology to make it a really efficient monitoring tool finally um, you are now uh, working to help other test developers carry out trials that will meet FDA regulations even though they say they are wrong now the FDA can you talk about efforts in a low-income Boston area to do the testing you feel needs to be done at this point yeah we found out that uh, the at-home test by mandates of the USA regulatory requires a mobile phone and many people don't even have access to that mobile phone. And we centered our attention to the more um, uh, underprivileged population. Sometimes they only speak Spanish, sometimes they're elderly. So we're now working in Chelsea, Massachusetts to enable and educate the population on how they could use the rapid test. All the tests we deployed in our study had been validated in Europe, in Asia, and in the lab. So they're highly performing, even some better than some of the FDA-approved ones. So we do not deploy anything that we don't know that it will perform well. And moreover, we teach them how to use the, the app, the phone app. So yes, it's a very interesting project. We were looking forward to work with the community for the next four months.